morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it is wonderful as always to see all of you with your faces uh, on our regulars. But I also want to extend a warm welcome to visitors if we have any today in our service, uh, even those watching online. Uh, we want to welcome you to this morning's service. Um, to mo uh, this morning, we will be here together uh, in fellowship. I believe and trust that uh, the service itself today, the message, will be able to uplift you and encourage you, particularly during this festive season. And last time, when I was leading the service, I promised you that there will be coffee and tea <laughs> after the service. Then it happened that it was our general meeting, therefore there was no coffee and tea. But today, I verified and I confirmed. <laughs> so I invite you to join us for coffee and tea after the service. Let me call you to worship uh, by reading our scripture this morning from Exodus chapter 15, uh, from verses 1 to 21. There will be many verses. 21 verses, so you can open your Bibles to Exodus uh, chapter 15, verses 1 to 21, or you can follow this I read. Exodus, the second book in the Old Testament, chapter 15. Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver is held into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army has been held into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depth like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger and it consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the water piled up. The surging water stood up like a well. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils. I will guard myself on them, I will draw my sword, and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, waking wonders. You stretch out your right hand, and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble, and which will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as torn until your people pass by. Lord, until the people you watch pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established, the Lord reigns forever and ever. When fire horses and chariots and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them, but the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbre in her hand, and all the women followed him with temperance and dancing. Miriam said to them, 
sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver has been held into the sea. Amen. Now, this was a song of praise in response to the Lord's power and rule over the Egyptian army. Uh, the people of Israel were celebrating their redemption from slavery from Egypt. This is a wonder of salvation. A wonder that they could pass through the Red Sea on dry ground. The Egyptians trying to do the same were actually drowned. So today we join the Israelites on that day responding to God's great power and rule displayed through Jesus Christ. Death on the cross. The wonder it is for us today this morning that Jesus Christ had to die, shed his blood to redeem us from slavery that is sin. But this one that God performed on our behalf, based on grace, nothing, we could not contribute anything to our salvation. It was purely out of God's grace. So how do we respond? Well, this morning, that's why we are here. We are going to worship, but as well to continuously to live our lives according to God's will. So this morning, uh, let's pray together as we open up our service. Heavenly Father and gracious God, we thank you for, we thank you with all our hearts for the glorious plan that you proposed before the creation of the earth, that you will redeem us sinful men by sending Jesus Christ to become the perfect son of man who was willing to live a sinless life, to die a perfect death so that all those who believe in his name will not be condemned but have eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. This name of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you, Father, for reconciling the world to yourself. You no longer count our sins against us, but rather you clothe us with your own righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing grace. Lord, we also thank you for the gift of life, for the bread that sustains this life, for the food of this air that nature has us, Lord, for the love of family and friends. We thank you, Lord, for the mystery of all creation, for the beauty that our eyes can see, for the joy that our ears may hear. We thank you, Lord, for this day and one more time to experience your presence and Lord, to experience your promises, to be with us, to be our God, and to give salvation for all these things, Lord, and blessings we give you thanks. So Lord, this morning, we pray, Lord, that you may empower us to praise you, not with words and actions which come from outside of us, but from within, Lord. Dwelling us more fully, that we may sing to you with our being. Lord, we pray that you Fill us with a sense of your joy that we might actually delight in your worship. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, uh, we invite the worship team uh, to lead us and I'll ask you to stand as we worship together. Then after the worship team, I'll ask Zoe to come and light up our candles this morning. Worship team, please stand.
Yeah. 
Why? So we do this lighting up the kittles. Well, let me draw your attention to some of the announcements that we have today. Now, this morning we started with the text from Exodus where Israel, Israel is celebrating their redemption from Israel. But when we know the history, I think we all know the history of Israel, what happens later. Terrible. And Paul will take that example of Israel's unbelief in the book of Romans. And this is what Pastor Kevin will unpack uh, today in Romans 9, verse 13, to give us a warning. So Pastor Kevin will be preaching from Romans uh, chapter 9, from verses 30 to 33, which is a warning of hope for So I'm looking forward to hear God's word this morning. Also, to remind us to realize uh, the 22nd of December, Carol's in, uh, in the Garden at our church office. So, 22 December from 5 p.m. at the church office. If you don't come beside church office, if you come beside, uh, I don't know you find people here, but if you go to the church office, this is where the Carol's will be happening. Uh, then there will be no Sunday service on the 26th of December. Please hear us again uh, because if you wake up that morning, coming to church, you won't find anyone here. So put it down that on the 26th of December, there won't be any Sunday service. As a church, we are looking for people who can help to maintain uh, our power boxes. And beds in the chapel. So, if anyone wants to help, come along, speak to Syria, uh, help will be greatly appreciated. Well, this morning we have got four of our great days, Reverend uh, Small Bonds on the 14th, uh, and the journey will preach, should be turning 80, if I'm correct, but I can 80, right? Yeah, wow. So, We'll be praying for them and celebrating. So, one eight. One eight. <laughs> I thought you say eighty. I'm like, who's that Jenny who's telling eight? Yeah. Anyway, eighty years. Uh, so where I come from, when you take eighteen, we put a low just called low mark. That means now you become an adult. So we celebrate becoming an adult uh, when you take eighteen. But we thank God for all those eighteen years for Jenny and for whatever. Uh, small ones. Uh, also have Brian and Margaret who will be celebrating their anniversary on the 14th. Uh, Malcolm and Angela Leeds, Peter and Maggie again small bonds. So Reverend Peter will celebrate his baby day on the 14th. Then on the 16th I uh, will celebrate his anniversary. Alex and Kitty uh, they also be celebrating their anniversary on the 16th. Oh, Alan and Lindy on the 18th as well, and Dave and Jill. So many people celebrating their anniversary. We thank God uh, for sustaining their babies, especially during this time when we are living well but high rates of divorce. These people are an example to us as Christians. In our family focus, uh, we have an Arthur, Bradley, Mike, Lulu, Joshua, Mika, Bresla, Fadim Brown, Marine and Paul Carson. So I will ask Uncle Saul to come and to pray for um, our family focus. Morning, church. I'd like to read a small portion of scripture to you this morning, found in uh, Psalm 112, verses 1 to 8. Praise the Lord, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great uh, delight in his command. 
We strongly will be mighty in the land. The generation of a bride will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Even in the darkness, light dawns for the upright. For the gracious and compassionate and righteous man, good will come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Surely he will never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered forever. He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure. He will have no fear till thus far. Your Father, we come this morning to you. And we want to exalt this morning your name, O Jesus. For you are worthy to be praised. And worthy is your name this morning, Lord. Your Father, we only give you thanks. Because, Lord, thanks this morning, Lord, is due to your name. And Father, we can we go from thee, Lord? Because, Lord, you are God that knows everything, Lord. You even search this morning the deepest heart, Lord. You even search this morning the mind of men, Lord. And dear Father, this morning we come this morning in all adoration, Lord, and we give you this morning praise, Lord. Thank you this morning, Lord, that we have come this morning to the house, Lord, this morning to, to worship you, Lord. We have come this morning, Lord, to receive a blessing, Lord. And we know this morning that we will receive a blessing from our own, Lord. Now I want to pray this morning, especially on, on family this morning, Lord. We know this morning, dear Father, that we live in a time where hardship is, is a life, Lord. And, and we know this morning, dear Father, that we are living in difficult times. And I want to pray this morning, Lord, just open up doors this morning, Lord, for various families, Lord. For those who are in need this morning, Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord, with a cry, Lord. Come and help us this morning, Lord, because we know as families, Lord, this morning, we need you. Also, I pray this morning, Lord, for those who are about to celebrate anniversaries, Lord. I pray this morning, Lord, come and touch them, Lord Jesus. Even for another year that you will add to their lives, Lord. Let them remember that the Lord will always be steadfast to them. Thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Let's be praying in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, well, we'll continue in the attitude of prayer. Uh, we pray for all those who are traveling during these uh, holidays. And also we are going to pray for Megan. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Megan, Lord. Thank you for your excellent service and support. For those who are working as missionaries uh, here in our country. Lord, we pray and ask that you may bless you with uh, Godly wisdom, as Solomon requested. We also ask God for special blessing of discernment for Him, Lord. Your word demands the Lord, so Lord, we pray for strength. Now, as she goes on this 10 week home assignment, Lord, we, we pray she will be able to have uh, fruitful meetings with. Uh, support us 
and also got enough waste so that you'll be able to come back refreshed, be energized and ready to continue to save you by saving others and keeping the sheep of many missionaries afloat. Lord, we also pray as we come to the end of this year, Lord, we want to thank you for all those who have been involved in the life of this church in many various ways. Lord, we pray that you continue to grant them strength, pray for your graces, and that you continue to encourage them and that they will not grow weary in doing good, for in due season they will reap a reward. We also pray, Lord, for next year, that you give all of us here today a hard desire to save you and be involved in the life of our church. You have gifted and blessed us in so many ways, Lord. Help us to use all that in your service for your glory. Lord, we also think, Lord, of those who are traveling just during this holiday. We pray for traveling messes. The word says that you will never leave or forsake us. You are always with us. We are going to travel safely, knowing that you will never leave their sight. May they reach their destination in peace. May your love surround them and your spirit to guide them. We also pray this morning, Lord, as we have been preparing our hearts for your word, we pray for Pastor Kevin, as he will come to preach, give him grace, humility, and courage to preach your word to us. And for us, Lord, we pray to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that will receive your good news, gospel. By your spirit, Lord, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Please take as we invite our uh, worship team to lead us into one more song, then Pastor Kevin will come and preach Sunday school. Uh, I think after one song, you can leave to your classes with Auntie Kevin. Please stand.
and uh, see if there's a visitor upstairs. Well, is there a baby squeak? When is that happening? End of January. End of January. Okay, we've we'll been praying for you. And uh, if you're nervous to be sitting behind me there, it might happen sooner than later. <laughs> And thank you, Benito, for leading our service there. Benito leaves tomorrow, so he was mentioning to me that he's struggling tomorrow at 5 o'clock. So if you would like to bless him with a lift to the airport, uh, please speak to Benito afterwards. Uh, calling on all those really big. Have you got someone? Yeah, I'm still calling this. Rowan's going to take you. Okay, so thank you, Rowan. But, um, if you are somehow able to help as well, if you may be going out that way, uh, then speak to, to Benito. Rome and enjoy your time away, and likewise Megan as well, and all of you who are traveling, I wish you a safe uh, trip, I hope you have a meaningful time away with your, with your family, I know there's others as well, I thought I say too many, I will forget somebody, so, but to all of you who are traveling at the best uh, time away. And just one thing that I did mention, we do have a Christmas Day service, and that's why we're not, on the 25th, we're not having a, a service on the 26th. So that's Boxing Day, so uh, you, uh, just so you are aware of that. If you have turned already in your Bible to Romans chapter 9, well done, you're probably a regular here. Uh, if you haven't, and if you are a visitor, we're working through the book of Romans, and we have to Romans chapter 9, and the last few verses in the book of Romans, it's so fitting uh, at this time of the year uh, as we think about the advent of Christ, the coming of Christ, the lighting of candles, that we think of the significance of the cross coming means to us. And so we pray for us that God will help us to understand this eternal word. Lord, we thank you for the book of Romans, what it has meant to us so far. Thank you, Lord, that even as we come to the end of another chapter, and Lord willing, hopefully we will finish this chapter today, we do thank you, Lord, for what you have done in our hearts, what you have shown us, how you have revealed yourself to us, the many difficult uh, truths we've had to grapple with, uh, many things that our limited minds have, have uh, had perhaps difficulty getting around. But we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who speaks to us, who shows us your ways, who lives in our hearts as believers, and that we are able to understand these things, that these things uh, need not uh, be some unknown mystery, do not serve an unknown God, but we serve a known God who has revealed himself to us. And so speak to us now, Lord, we pray, and through your word, in Jesus' name, amen. It says, what then shall we say? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, verse 30, have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursue the law as the way of righteousness have not obtained their goal, why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. It's that far to the end of the chapter. What is Paul speaking about here? What is going on in these in these verses, perhaps you're feeling maybe a good company, a little bit confused as I read them. What is this all meaning? What is this all about? That people stumbling over stones, people falling over a rock, uh, people not pursuing something, got it, uh, while others who were pursuing it didn't get it. It sounds all a little bit upside down, doesn't it? A little bit back to front. At least uh, if, we, if we haven't been following in these previous chapters and in this particular chapter. Paul has been explaining God's mercy. He's been explaining God's sovereign choice in who he saves and how merciful he is in his choosing and who he chooses and, and how he works. Traditionally, we know that uh, in particular, as, as Paul has been addressing uh, the Gentiles and how God has chosen the Gentiles, understand that is the context which he is speaking about, and that God has chosen Gentiles into his kingdom. Traditionally, these were godless people who really had, had such limited knowledge of God. If anything, very little to no fear of him. In addition to the Jews that he had chosen, God's Old Testament had chosen covenant people. And why, as we've seen previously, 
Because why? Who, who are we to question God in His in His choice that He has chosen to to save the ungodly, the unrighteous? Because we are clay in the Potter's hands, and He can do what He likes with His clay, and because He knows what's best. But also because He is merciful, and we must always understand that in terms of God choosing and God's working in the context of His mercy, that none of us deserve to be spared, none of us deserve to be as 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 saved, and we're all deserving of His wrath, as we saw last week, because of our sin, but God in His great love and mercy has saved and chosen people to be His own. And now it's all brought together in these last few verses. This is few verses that we're looking at here today. It is in a sense a conclusion or a, an exclamation mark at the end of a very long sentence. And he sums up what's been said and why it is so. In verses 30 and 31, what has been said, uh, uh, Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, those Gentiles who were not God's people, that they have received righteousness. That's what he's saying. That's quite a controversial statement, maybe not for us, but certainly to his audience that he was speaking to. We have to try and imagine, take yourself back 2,000 plus years ago to a time even before then. There's a place in Jerusalem where you, it's near the Western Way Wall, which is a very familiar site, where there are archaeological ruins, but they have found them underneath existing buildings. And so you go down two meters in these steps to go underneath the building, almost like a basement, where these, these archaeological digs that have taken place, and where they found ruins that date back to 70 AD. The houses and, and artifacts there left as the Romans left them when they destroyed Jerusalem. And, uh, and there's a sign as you go, you're going down two meters, you're descending two meters and going back 2,000 years. Go back 2,000 years and try and imagine the context in which Paul is speaking. A time even before then, years leading up to that, whereas today the vast majority of the Middle East, of course, is Arabic Muslims who surround this pocket of Israelis in, in, in Israel. But both of them, both Muslims and, and Israelis, believe in a monotheistic God, that is, one single God. Just one, uh, one God who is a moral God, who is an unchanging God, as is written in the pages of the Quran and in the pages of the Torah. But then, back then, 2,000 years ago, of course, remember, it was mostly pagan. You had these Israelis surrounded by pagan nations, paganism, as we would even understand today. Israelites, they, back then, were surrounded by neighbors who were vastly different to themselves. Still hostile, even perhaps more hostile than today, but vastly different in their worldview and in their religious belief, beliefs. Uh, many of them back then believed in a polytheistic, many gods, not a mono, one god. And they looked, believed in many gods. Our best way to try and understand it is to go to a, a Hindu country and try and Picture yourself there where you have many gods who are worshipped, all different shrines and temples and all different ways to worship different gods. That's the world in which Paul is writing then, back then 2,000 years ago. The Israelites were surrounded by these neighbors who were so different to them and so unlike them. The Gentiles around them were like that. Were, were, they served uh, volatile and unpredictable gods. One such, of course, is Baal, Baal worship, which you often read about in the Old Testament, that involved even human sacrifices. It was a dark, scary world full of superstition. It was uh, that where they worshipped man-made idols and, and images made to look like mortal, uh, created beings, things, animals and creatures and people. In chapter 1, verse 23 of Romans, we read that. Instead of one true immortal creator God. Because they didn't believe in, in absolute truth, in, in one God, morality and ethics was a very relative thing. Whatever you want it to be, it's, it's you decide what's right and what's wrong. There is no absolute truth, but many truths and all roads lead to the gods and to uh, a 
higher states of being. And so there was a very conflicting, a strong conflicting ideas of, of who God or gods is or are. And, uh, and so you had this mush of different ideas, this, this uh, conglomerate of different ideas of who God is. And so because of that, morality and ethics becomes very relative to you. They didn't have the word of God. And so along with it came all kinds of evil that we read in Romans chapter 1 verse 24. There's a long list there of sexual impurity of all kinds. All kinds of sexual impurity and uh, how they had exchanged mankind and exchanged truth for a lie. It talks about shameful lusts and unnatural relationships. How they were filled with every kind of wickedness and evil and greed and depravity adventures full of envy, murder, strife deceit and malice and the list goes on and on. They invented ways of doing evil it says. They lack understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. These are Gentile people. It's anonymous there. I find sound like a, a very racist thing to say to, to generalize people like that but that is synonymous with the people who were not Jews. Gentiles. They were unbelievers. They were sinful people. They were idolaters and immoral for the most part. And as I say, I'm generalizing, broadly generalizing, but these are the things that we read about them in the scriptures. But then Jesus came. But then Jesus came. And his power to save took hold of such unlikely, godless people irreligious and idolatrous people, even God-haters, and saved them, and changed them to be the exact opposite of what we read about in Romans chapter 1. Not because, as Paul has told us, because they pursued righteousness, that they found it, that somehow these were upright, good, wholesome people, God-fearing people, but rather by faith they obtained it. They, a righteousness that is by faith. The unrighteous receive that which they were not themselves. Righteousness. They actually obtain it. It's an interesting word there. Uh, Nirvana is the, it's like the root word that you find there. And that Jesus, the word that Jesus received the children into himself, the same word Nirvana is used there, that he received. Here the idea is even stronger than that, that it's they, they almost forcibly took hold of this, the gospel. They were so happy to get it, they received it forcibly, they obtained it, they, they grabbed it, we might say, in, a, in ordinary English. These are religious people who heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Then he came into the sinful world and died to save all people of their sins, both Jew and Gentile alike including them, these irreligious idolaters, including you and including me. God came into this world. This is why we celebrate Christmas, that God sent his son for this, to the ungodly, to the irreligious, to the unrighteous, to all who believe. The worst of people even can receive this good news, this gospel, this salvation that we speak about. Those who receive the message and believed it by faith, became children of God, a righteous people, that is, people right with God, justified before God, just as if they had never sinned. And now we are adopted into the covenant family of God. Think of the Gentiles as the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Great story, that prodigal son. There's so much in it. Who, who remember this young boy, the young man took the father's inheritance, give me my inheritance, and he, he went off and wasted his life on wild, reckless, sinful living. Eventually he comes to his senses and he returns to the father, who, when he sees him, he sees his wayward son, still far away, he was filled with compassion, we're told, for him, and he ran to this filthy, unclean son of his who had been with pigs and was feeding unclean animals, looking after the animals, and there he was, and he, this father throws his arm around this unclean, defiled, uh, sinful, undeserving son of his, and he embraces him, and he kisses him. 
a sign of peace, a sign of reception, a sign even of forgiveness. Here is, here is then the, the honest and the, the reliable son, the oldest son, the hard-working son who stayed at home, the older brother who stayed at home. And, and of course, he objects to what he sees happening, though. He sees there's a, a celebration, a feast in honor of his son, who is his brother who has now returned, the father's uh, youngest son. And he objects to this younger brother's reception that the father is killing the fattened calf. That is the, that's like the Christmas turkey. That is the, the, the bigger, he only kept that for big occasions like weddings. Uh, that was the big occasion that he would kill the fattened calf. Prepared for that occasion. And yet he doesn't, he wastes this fattened calf on my useless younger brother who's a scoundrel and has wasted the family's inheritance. And he's upset with his father, he's angry with his father, holding a feast in celebration of the son's return. The older brother is unhappy. Paul was experiencing a bit of that unhappiness as well from Jewish people who objected to the idea that, 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 uh, that Jewish people, the people of Israel, who were objecting to the, these sinful Gentiles being promised salvation, being offered the covenant promises, of being given relationship to the Father. That the Jews, this is what Paul was saying, who pursued through the law a way of righteousness that get it, yet those unworthy, unlikely Gentiles, you're saying they can have it, they can get it, and they're receiving it. So Paul, you can imagine, was getting the same sort of uh, frosty reception from the Jews who objected to what Paul was teaching, what Paul was saying. Strictly, these people had, had followed the requirements of the Old Testament, the rules, and, 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 and yet they had not received salvation, is what Paul was saying. They had obeyed, they had observed the law, they had been diligent and fanatical, and they, they were fundamentalists in their observation of the law. They, they were technically spot on for a large part. That, that's hard work. If you ever study what the Old Testament law requires, what the Torah requires, it's difficult. It affects every area of your life. What you eat, how you act, what you wear, what you do, on what days, it affects everything. Every single aspect of your life is affected by the law. Hundreds of rules and regulations. To be an Orthodox Jew affected everything and it was hard work. It still is in order to somehow achieve the righteousness that they are striving for and working so hard for. And Paul says you're not going to obtain your goal. You haven't obtained your goal through the law. And that's what, the Romans, what Romans tells us, what Paul is saying. Then in verse 32 to 33, we see there, why is this so? And Paul gives an explanation. It just seems upside down. It doesn't seem right. You know, it doesn't seem fair that such a thing could happen. It doesn't sound right or fair, but it sounds like foolishness. Those who worked for something didn't achieve it, while those who didn't work for it or didn't deserve it, they somehow have got it. It's a scandal, isn't it, that such a thing could happen? That's what they're saying. Why not, in verse 32? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works, what Paul tells us. They used the wrong methodology. They used the wrong and a formula to get there. Instead of believing in the gift of God's grace, they had tried in their own efforts. And we do much the same, and we very subtly think somehow we can earn our own salvation, that we can win God's favor, and somehow that He will have mercy on us and save us. We must not think that God's choosing to save and the supernatural work of God that takes place in such an event dissolves us of our responsibility to respond to the gospel of grace. Paul has, has refuted that idea that somehow if we save by grace, it absolves us of any righteousness or any uh, uh, having to live a moral or, or serving the Lord or any obligations or any sort of response to God. Quite the contrary, because of the gift of God's grace, we have responsibility to respond to the gospel of grace by which we are saved. Such great love, such great mercy that, that demands our response, our lives, our all. Faith is the key to open the door 
of salvation through Jesus Christ. That if it were not that way, if we are not saved by faith in God, by the grace and mercy of God, if it was simply based on our ability alone to be good people, to somehow generate enough faith in ourselves and, and to strive in our own efforts to, to be saved, to be good enough to work our way towards that, who would get the credit if such a person were saved? Whose glory would it be if such a thing were possible? It would be ours. If somehow I could work my way into heaven, if somehow I could be good enough as a person to earn God's favor for him to have mercy on me in order to save me. But instead, God alone is the one who gets the glory. He alone is the one who is saved. He is the one who is made away. It is a, a his bill. He has paid the price and has made the supreme sacrifice for our sins. And so we must see that all our, our feeble efforts cannot compare with the work of Jesus Christ, both in terms of its authenticity, that Jesus was the perfect, unblemished, sinless Lamb of God, and in terms of intensity, that death, the death that he died, was the ultimate price that was paid for our sins. You see, faith in God has always been God's method to unlock His grace and to serve Him with success. This is not just a New Testament concept. In Hebrews 11, it tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. That everyone who ever did anything right in the eyes of God did so by faith from the very beginning. A few people are mentioned in, in Hebrews chapter 11. It's not an exhaustive list, list, but a few people are mentioned by name as having lived and acted by faith to do the will of God and bringing about the purposes and opening up His promises. He mentions them by name. Right back to Abel and Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, and even the prostitute Rahab acted as an unrighteous person acted by faith in order to secure God's purposes. All of them lived by faith. Instead of faith in God as a way to please Him and unlock His promised salvation, Israel had tried by way of their own good works, by their own efforts, and their own strength, and their own ability to do instead of by faith in the power of God and the wisdom of God to do so for them. And by sending his son, Jesus Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God, as 1 Corinthians 1 24 says, he exposed their sinful unbelief in him and their pride and their confidence in themselves to save themselves rather than their confidence being rooted in God. And this was never clearer and never more and clearly demonstrated by the way that they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of God Himself. When God sent them the Messiah, when God sent them the Saviour, they rejected Him and chose rather to live by the law. Some, of course, did believe, as there are always exceptions, but mostly He was not received by His own people. And so the people of Israel, as we are told in this passage, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. Jesus Christ, the Rock of Ages, became the very rock that they stumbled over. Isaiah 26 verse 4 says, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. The rock, the rock of ages, the rock eternal. Jesus predicted their rejection of him in, in Matthew chapter 21 and Mark 12 and Luke 20, they had parallel uh, verses, chapters. By telling them the parable of the tenants, or sorry, the parable of the tenants rather, the tenants, the people who rent property, the tenants of the vineyard. And he went to the temple courts, and there were these chief priests and the elders and the peoples and the people of Israel were. He talked to them about this. And he told them this, this parable of the tenants of the vineyard. And we talk about taking the fight right to them. Go to the temple, stand in the temple courts, look for some priests and, and the chiefs and the people of the elders of Israel and tell them the story. That there was this vineyard, which is the world, it's God's kingdom, God's world, who the land under God himself established and then was given to some tenants to look after. 
farmers, who in this case, of course, it's Israel. Israel renting the land from God. It's not their land, they just have been entrusted with it by God. When, of course, harvest time comes, the landowner, first of all, he sends his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit and payment and to pay the rents. The tenants rejected the landowner's servants, uh, who represent, of course, the prophets of the Old Testament, who they beat, who they stoned, and even killed in real life history. And so then the landowner sent his own son to come and get the rent, to get the fruit, the harvest at harvest time. Jesus, of course, would be this very son was the Son of God who had been sent, and God had sent, who they would later beat and kill, as Jesus prophesied his own death in that parable. What then will the landowner do, the question is asked. He asks the people, he says, they will throw those wretched people out, they will be cast out. We will hold them to account for what they have done, and give the land to others. There he announces, there he prophesies and he's speaking of the inclusion of all who will believe, in, in particular Gentiles, which seems such a far-reached uh, far uh, uh, prophecy and out of the ordinary thing to say. These are the Gentiles who would then be given the land and God's covenant promises and the kingdom of God, who will give him when he comes his share of the crop, who will produce fruit in keeping with repentance, a crop of, uh, during the harvest time. Then remarkably, Jesus quotes the Messianic Psalm, of Psalm 118, verse 22, that the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So this idea of this rock, this stone, is not just peculiar to here where Paul is speaking about it, it is a concept that you find all over in Scripture. That's why we often refer to Jesus as being the rock of our salvation. In Luke chapter 20, then he says, Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Matthew 21, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. Talking to the Jews, the, the, the priests and the elders there, and given to people who will produce its fruit. So I say, telling them that the Gentiles will be included by sending his son. Now we remember and we celebrate in Christmas this advent of Christ who has come. God lay a stone in Zion. And Paul draws from the Old Testament scriptures on what is written and he quotes Isaiah 8 and Isaiah 28 as proof to substantiate his claims that this is what God has done. This is not me, Paul, saying it. This is what God has done. Their stumbling and their fall had been foreseen by even Isaiah, one of their own prophets. It was prophesied at a time of disaster and judgment. It was prophesied during a time of uh, 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 foreseeing a time of disaster and judgment coming on God's people, on all those who had rejected God. But refuge and deliverance for all who trusted Him to be saved. That stone, this stone, this rock, is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which acts in the same way to those who reject it. They stumble over it. They will be judged for it and stand as God's enemies. But to all who believe, they will never be put to shame as the promise here. Perhaps you know something about castles. Maybe Ethan knows something about castles. You can ask him after. Do you know something about castles, Ethan? I'm sure you do. He knows a lot about dinosaurs. If you want to know anything, you can ask him. But yeah, this idea of a, of a castle, or a fortress, uh, those were formidable ideas, this idea of, 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 of a fortress in which you are safe. Uh, they acted as, as ancient systems, even weapons, uh, to, to the outside advancing army. You would be uh, subjected, if you were the advancing army against the castle, uh, you would be subjected to all kinds of assaults. You would have sniper arrows coming at you. They would pelt you with rocks. Uh, there would be boiling liquids thrown down on you. There were fiery objects shot at you. For those on the inside, that very same thing, that, that weapon of destruction, that castle, that fortress, that safe, that would be a safe haven for you. If you were on the inside, you were safe. If you're on the outside, 
well, it was not a very nice place to be. And so you were sheltered from the enemy's attack, and you were safe within that castle. The same idea is true of the Lord being a rock, of being our fortress, really, isn't he? Who suddenly he is a stumbling stone, a rock that people fall over. He is an offense to them. Some of your versions will actually say that it is an offense. They use the word offense there. They stumble, they are offended by it. They stumble and they fall because they do not believe the word of God concerning Jesus Christ and put their faith in him to be saved. Rather, they rely on their own words. They do not trust in God's way, what He has provided, but they trust in themselves to their own downfall. I'm sure many of you uh, have, can see how there is this dual purpose in this rock, this, this idea of the Lord Jesus Christ, in what He has done. For us who believe in Him, He is the one through whom we will never be put to shame. If you do not believe in Him, you only will stand to stumble over that very rock. The gospel is an offense to those who will not believe because it pierces through the heart of self-righteousness. It pierces through our pride and it stands in the, as it stands in the way of God's grace. Remember the story of the Trojan horse? So many of you know the story. I know you've all watched Troy and uh, yeah, I know it's confession time with movies you watch out uh, on Netflix and I just opened the whole new world to you. Uh, and there's this story, I'm sure you've ever read it in storybooks, about this horse in which the, the other army was hiding in. And of course they, they couldn't breach this castle, they couldn't get in. And so they came up and devised this Trojan horse in which they hid the other army. Then this fortress lowered its defences. Opened the gates and let this Trojan horse, they pulled it in. And once it was in, of course, the enemy came out and destroyed that city. For many of us, we have our faith in the wrong thing. We are trying too much in our own efforts, in our own strength, in our own abilities. Perhaps this passage is true of us today. But too much of us is about us, not about what God has done in us. Too much of what we tell people is about what we've been able to do, or how great we are, and not about how great God is and what God has done in our lives. To those who believe, they have obtained salvation by faith. He is our rock of refuge. He is our fortress. He is our foundation stone on which our whole lives stand and are built. On whom does your hope rest? On Christ the God, solid rock you stand? Or do you stand on yourself, on the sands of your success, of your ability to do good, of your ability to live right, but your ability to do things your way? Or is your life built on God's grace and His power to save you? Do you stand on that, God's sure foundation stone, Jesus Christ, the only way to be saved? We have this message to bring. As we go out from this place today, as you go maybe back to work, maybe you'll leave already, you go back to your family, whatever the case might be. Sometimes we look at this world and we just see Gentiles, don't we? We just see godless people. We look at these people as hopeless people who will never believe, who will never trust in God. Let us remember when we leave this place today that we're going into a mission, that we're going into the mission fields, that all of us, God has placed us in positions when we are among the Gentiles, unbelievers, idolaters. As you go to Christmas parties, as you go to family dinners, all these things, yes, in many ways, it might be a hostile environment that you're in, but never forget the power of the gospel to change people. Never forget God's love and mercy, and that perhaps God is doing a work in someone's heart that you are in contact with. Pray that God will give you the words to say. We have this message of hope and how we might be saved through by faith in Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, and be willing to share this good news that I've told you about here today. Put your faith in Him if you're not a believer. You've never trusted in Him and you think somehow I'll be okay. I think somehow I'll be good enough. I'm sure God will remember all the good things I've done and not just all the bad things I've done. You are looking for something that is effective. You must know this. God is a holy God. He has made a way for you to be saved. 
you sin, you need to put your faith and trust in him to be saved. He will do the transforming work, the change that's needed in your life by his Holy Spirit. With his word in your life, he will change you to be that better person. Don't wait to be that better person before you come to God. Think, when I get it, when I can just get my life together, when I can just get my act together, when I can just stop doing all those things that I do, then I'll be ready for God. You'll never get there. Trust in God today. Put your faith and trust in Him today so that you can be saved and God can do that work that's needed in you to deal with all those things in your life that are not fitting for any child of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you for the reminder to us of your grace and your mercy, Lord. Perhaps, Lord, we are like that younger son, Lord, who our lives just resemble wild and reckless living, Lord. We live in such godless ways and do such ungodly things, Lord. Oh, Lord, we pray for your grace and mercy, Lord, on those here today, Lord, who are so, in a sense, far from you, Lord God. We know, Lord, that they're never too far for you to reach them. For you, by your grace and by your power, to reveal them in, Lord, draw them to yourself. May that person, Lord, here today, give them the faith that they need, Lord God, to receive you by faith, put their faith and trust in you to be saved. Lord, perhaps there are others here today that we are, we are like the, the, the Jews in this passage, Lord. We are self-righteous. We are full of pride. We somehow pat ourselves on the back and say to ourselves, well done, you did so good. And Lord, we are relying on our own pride and our own egos, our own abilities, Lord God, and not on you. I have mercy on us, Lord, and we put our faith and trust in you in every area of our lives, knowing that by the grace of God we stand here. By the grace of God and by his mercy, we can serve you, Lord God. And so, Lord, we pray that as we go from this place now into a world, Lord God, that so desperately needs you, Lord, we, we see so much that is that is contrary to your ways, Lord God, that you would not be pleased with, that you are not pleased with, Lord. And Lord, give us boldness to speak, courage to say things, Lord. Give us, Lord, your word, your word on our lips, that we might be able to always tell people of the good news of Jesus Christ and how they might be saved. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us now today. And may be planted deep into our hearts as we go from this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'll ask the musicians to come and lead us in one more song today. And we close our service off and enjoy some tea and coffee and even some biscuits. And we would be so well behaved if we had some biscuits today. <laughs> Here is a box of biscuits where you can eat. Let's stand and let's sing.
all spirit and soul and body be kept blameless in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Lord God's people say, Amen.